Join us on a trip back in time while we explore your family history. We'll visit with genealogists, historians, and others just like you and me and share their tips, tricks, and troubles that they've run into along the way. On today's episode, Deb Sweeney will join us. She'll talk with my wife, Sue, about creating research plans. Together, they will build one designed to uncover some of Sue's noble maritime past. First, though, we are going to talk about the benefits of conducting an interview with a family member and how to make it memorable and successful. Journey along with us on Discovering Your Past. So a few weeks back, I was looking through some city directories of Atlantic City, New Jersey, following my mother's parents and my mother's family. So I found an entry for my grandparents, uh, both living together, and I found another entry for my grandfather and grandmother, uh, but this time they were both living separately. And on top of that, my grandfather had remarried and had a couple of kids. I thought that it was a little odd. I don't remember my mother sharing this information with me. So I called her about it and she said, oh yeah, you know Snooky and them. And well, I had heard the name before, but I didn't realize that they were stepbrother and stepsister. So I figured it was about time that I did a proper family interview with my mother and, and learn the stories and the history and everything that there is to know about who is Claire Young. Okay, my name is Claire Young, Claire Virginia Young. Cut. <laughs> so I did a little bit of research on what makes a good family interview, and there's a lot of information out there on the web. Um, and having a film and television background, I decided to break it up into the same three steps as if I was making a movie. Pre-production, production, and post-production. It's something I could relate to, and it fits pretty well with the way that things work. So the pre-production step is all about preparation. So one of the first steps would be to figure out what kind of questions to ask. And the internet, again, yields so many different choices. Um, some websites have long lists, some have very short lists. Um, the Family Tree Magazine site, for instance, has a list of 20 questions for interviewing relatives, while the UCLA Library Center for Oral History Research has probably a list of about 75 questions or so. It's broken up pretty decently. So if I were you, I would search for different lists of questions and see which ones work right for you and which ones you can skip past. The other thing that you want to do is ask open-ended questions. Um, open-ended questions are questions that the subject's going to answer from personal experience. So questions such as, what was it like in the town that you grew up in versus what town did you grow up in is going to stretch out the answer and give you more information. I always yeah. called her grandma. Yeah. What do you remember about her? A little, very small, very short, always wore black. And she would run across, they lived on New Hampshire Avenue, and I mean cars were going up. She would just come right out of the house and sprint across the street and like people, you know, if a car was coming, they'd have taken her down. I mean, really, she never looked. She was really a hazard. <laughs> But she actually lived to see Debbie, my niece Debbie, so she was quite old when she passed away. The other thing that you want to do is ask the interviewee to gather some old photographs and heirlooms that might be lying around the house that you've always wanted to know more about but might have been afraid to ask. No, I would say Debbie was about seven or eight years old. I have the newspaper reports packed away. Well, we'll have to break those out. We'll have to break them out. And, and of course, there were pictures of it all, too. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, we had some good times. By doing this, this can also help jog their memory of, of other facts and things that they might have forgotten about. After you've gathered all of the materials that you might need to do the interview, it's time for production, the interview itself. There are several different ways to record the interview. You could do it with video, you could do it with audio, or you could do it with a good old-fashioned notebook. Each one has its advantages and some disadvantages as well. The notebook for me, I'm not a great note taker, so it would be very difficult for me to go through and make sure that I had all of the notes written down complete and accurate. Uh, but for some other people, this is the only way to go. Another way to record the interview would be audio only. And most cell phones nowadays have apps that allow you to record audio, and there are several specialty devices out there specifically for doing this. 
The other way, of course, is to record it with video. And video is great because you get to see people's reactions as they discuss topics and talk about their family. Um, a lot of people, however, are camera shy, and that would be the advantage to using audio over video. Of course, with both of these medias, you can go back and take notes afterwards, which is exactly what I did. We didn't have all this fancy stuff mm -hmm. like we've got now. So when I got to my mother's, the first thing I did was make sure that she was okay with me actually recording the, the interview. And, and that's something also that you want to make sure that you do is make sure that that person is, is very comfortable with you recording it if you're going to do it with audio or video. I had also decided with my mother early on that instead of asking her the questions of who was your father, when was he born, et cetera, et cetera, that since she was an artist, I, I gave her a big pad of paper and had her actually draw out her family tree. And I felt that this was a really unique way of doing that. And I think that she learned a lot about who people were and where they fell in the whole scheme of things as well. Going through the interview, we got off track quite a few times, and I don't know that the interview for us went chronological at all. We, we jumped around all over the place. I think that for the next interview I do, I will attempt to keep it a little bit more chronological, but again, I'm not going to be afraid that if we decide to talk about something completely different, because that's when the time is to talk about it, I'm not going to be afraid to do so. Oh, anyway. Star Wars. Anyway. Yes, you were too young to go. So, but your your cousin Peter, who was your father's sister's son, came to visit, and he was like maybe 13, 14. So he was perfect to see it. So, but you were too young to see it. And so Peter and I went to the movies and saw it, and Dad babysat for you. Or stayed home with you, I should say. And then you took me the next day? No, I didn't. The day after? Nope, you were too young. But you know what? I think you really would have enjoyed it. I, I got to tell you, that was the most amazing thing we ever saw. You're breaking my childhood. Oh, I'm sorry. During the interview itself, I took very minimal notes. But that allowed me to really listen and be able to ask follow-up questions. Um, and I mentioned about doing open-ended questions earlier and re-listening to the interview. I, I definitely need to work on that a little bit better. What years were, was this? 1969. I, or it must have been, no, maybe January 1970. It was like one of those, long did, time ago. Did you go alone? No. In the end, we spent four, maybe four and a half hours or so together. Uh, we did break it up a little bit. We did take a couple of breaks, uh, like for ice cream, for instance. And when we did take some breaks, I went ahead and I looked back at my notes that I had just to check some different questions and see what we had covered, what I wanted to make sure that we covered, and, you know, kind of remind myself in case one of those questions came up. So the last step is post-production or analyzing what information you found out in the interview itself. As soon as you can, you want to review all of that stuff while it's still fresh in your head. So what I'm doing is I'm going through the video footage about 15, 20 minutes at a time here and there. And I'm really separating everything that we talked about into four different groups. I'm separating it into facts, such as my father was born October 6th. I'm separating it into I think facts, such as I think my great-grandfather's middle name might have been Alexander. Something to look up for sure. And my father was John Alexander, I think, Nihilus. The third category that I'm separating these into are the stories that I want to research a little bit more, such as my mother used to work on Steel Pier, and I'd love to find some photographs of it. I guess when I was like 16 years old, I worked on the world famous Steel Pier. And I worked in a, a basketball concession. When three packs of cigarettes or, uh, no, when a carton of cigarettes or um, two boxes of salt water taffy, three shots for a quarter. The last category is the tidbits and just the other information, more historical nature such as the trolleys in Atlantic City were called jitneys, apparently. Um, nothing that really fills out the family history,
but stuff that fills out the history itself. In Atlantic City, if you know anything about Atlantic City, all of the streets are named after the states. So even before I went to school, I knew the states. It was Maine, New Hampshire, Vermont, Rhode Island, Massachusetts, Connecticut, Maryland, Delaware, Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, Tennessee, Illinois, Indiana, Ohio, Kentucky, and so on and so on. So oh, you can't keep going? I can keep going, but there's like, uh, you know, the, Texas, Missouri, Mississippi, um, and then from there I forget actually what now, they were. Now, were you telling me the order that the streets were That's from That's the order, south? Maine, New Hampshire, Vermont, Rhode Island. So I lived, we had a little small street between Maine and New Hampshire Avenue. Overall, I had a great time. I learned a lot of new things. I hope to get a chance to talk to my mother's sister down in Atlantic City soon, even if it is just by phone. I hope that this has inspired you to get out there and learn your family's stories and record some absolutely wonderful interviews. Hi, welcome to Access Nashua. It's the home of discovering your past. When you're recording your interview, you want to make sure you get the cleanest, clearest audio that you possibly can. And the easiest way to do that really is to keep the camera, well, it's keep it as close as you can to the subject. Um, right now, I'm just using a regular handy cam, and it's about a foot, foot and a half away, and I should sound pretty darn clear. But you'll notice when I set it down and walk away, well, that I sound much more hollow, and it's really kind of hard to hear. You're probably picking up some things like the air conditioner and maybe a fan or two as well. So do me a favor. Promise me that you'll keep that audio close and you'll get great results just like we did. Hi everyone, I'm Sue Young and I'm on Discovering Your Past with our special guest, Deborah Yegelingers. Sweeney. And we're speaking with Deborah today because we had some questions about how to go about your research project. So, um, Deb, thank you first for coming and joining us on the show again. I think oh, it's great to you. have you. It's wonderful to be here. I had so much fun the last time, I, I just had to come back. <laughs> well, that's great. That's great. Um, it's wonderful, this, all this technology. So, um, I'm going to start us off real quick, and I'm just going to get right into the meat of it, because this is something that it's, you know, everybody wants to know why is research plans so important? I mean, is, is it going to help you with your organization, or is it, I mean, some people would like to just wing things. Um, the whole point of having a research plan is so that you aren't winging it. Um, what happens is oftentimes we get so excited to jump into a project, we forget to stop and think, and we end up wasting a lot of time. And if we had just focused at the beginning and written a research plan, we would have answered our question or solved our problem that we're trying to figure out a lot more quickly. So. For me, a research plan is a way to just sit down, think about what I'm doing, and to move on from there. And research plans, they, they're meant to evolve. Um, you can start one, uh, get to a point where you've answered your question, and then usually you have a new question. So you want to start and write a new research plan. Well, that's great. So it, it'll help you kind of visualize where you need to, where you've been, where you need to go go next. Um, so exactly. are there different types of research plans that you should do? Or is there any particular style that as a, a genealogist, if you were tracking a specific family line, I mean, is it going to be different than, say, researching your college term paper? <laughs> um, basically, no. Um, what a professional genealogist does might be a little more involved and detailed than what you know the average person who's trying to figure out a question about their family is going to do. But 
they're basically the same thing. And there are lots of, if you've never done a research plan, there are lots of free templates that you can download to kind of get you started if you've never tried one before. FamilySearch has some. I looked at one from Macavo, which is another genealogy website. Um, Ancestry has their own version. Um, the Board of Certified Genealogists has a more in-depth one. So they're out there everywhere. So what are the different parts? I mean, obviously, you'd have to start at the beginning, but what is the beginning? I mean, I, with people's family histories being very different, but do they all kind of have a same overarching theme, like you want to start at the right spot? Exactly. They basically have five points that you want to hit. So number one is, what do you want to learn? Why, why are you making this plan in the first place? What is the purpose? So number one is just come up with a question. What do you want to learn? Um, number two, you want to figure out, well, what do I already know? So you want to activate, this is my teacher voice in here, you want to activate your prior knowledge. So instead of just jumping in and, you know, sitting on the internet and trolling websites and just jumping around, you want to really take a moment and analyze what you already have. So you're not redoing research that somebody else did or that you did. Um, step three is the analysis. So you want to take what you already had and you want to really look at it. You want to read everything. You want to um, determine maybe what the laws of a state were at the time that a document was made so that you're interpreting the document correctly. Um, because in the olden times, um, people got married at earlier ages or they were allowed to inherit property um, differently. Then step four is to actually sit down and make that plan. So you've looked at what you have, you've analyzed what you have, and now you want to go forward. So if I have a census record that places my ancestor in a town, what else can I learn about this ancestor in that town? So what other records are available? So that's the plan-making stage. And step five would be after you've made that list of records and libraries and the repositories where you think those records are located is to go out there and find them. And you also want to prioritize um, because a lot of us, you know, we don't have ready funds. So, you know, maybe paying for that $100 uh, Civil War pension file is not in our budget right now, but we can spend $20 to get a death, death certificate. So okay. you really want to prioritize the order of um, what you're going to do. Uh, prioritization, that's a good word. I think that's going to be the main word for the day. So can you help me? Can you help that's me make good. a research plan? <laughs> I can definitely help you make a research plan. So oh, great. I, I know that you have a lineage chart in front of you. I do. <laughs> <laughs> oh, as I, I block an ancestor's name. <laughs> I know that from that chart, we have to go all the way back to Moses Noble, who was born in 1813 and died in 1883. Okay. It was his family that made the move out of Portsmouth. Oh. So I would take, you know, maybe him, but he, you know, he didn't live most of his adult life in Portsmouth. and. From what I know, I think he was most likely a farmer or another craftsman. Oh, okay. So I know, I know you really want to know about those shipbuilders and those mariners. So maybe he's not a good person. Oh. So <laughs> <laughs> let's jump back a couple of generations. I want you to look at the two Mark Nobles. So we have one that was born in 1733. And right. And we have one that was born in 1761. Right. Do you know what happened soon after 1761? Well, I do believe that there was a big war, 
not too far after that. <laughs> okay. So chances are because of Mark, he was born in 1761. He might have been a little too young to serve in the war, but I wouldn't eliminate that because I had an ancestor who was born in 1764 and he ended up being a drummer boy. Um, oh, right 16. on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, he, you know, he's not too young, especially in the later part of the war. So 1787, around there, he, he could have fought, you know, at the tail end. So we could jump back a generation. To, we have a Mark that was born in 1733 before the, um, the Revolutionary War. And I believe Portsmouth had a thriving uh, port at that time. So he might be an ancestor that we could look further into to find out more about him. We could formulate a question like, who was Mark Noble born 1733 in Portsmouth, and what did he do for a living? Okay. That would really give us a narrow focus for our research our research question to begin with. Okay. So you like that? That That's a perfect start. <laughs> so to go to find this information out, um, I know that Portsmouth happens to have a really great historical epicenter, the Portsmouth Antheneum, um, and I believe that they have quite a bit of information on the noble family there. Um, would that be an okay place to start? Actually, I want you to back up a little bit because we're okay. just ahead to making a plan and we haven't really looked at some of our prior oh. knowledge because I helped you a little bit in the past on this fat family I discovered an article that was written in the 1940s um, by let me look you've got it in front of you too it was written by Frank Albert Davis oh yeah his article appeared in the New England Historical Genealogical Society's Register, um, and he traced the family of Christopher Noble, who was the immigrant ancestor who ended up in Portsmouth. We have a little bit of prior knowledge that Christopher was a mariner, so we know it was in the family, but we don't know exactly what he did. After reading the article about Christopher, we discovered that one of the descendants in Sue's lineage is mentioned in this article, and that's the Mark Noble that was born in 1733. The problem is the article doesn't really say much of anything about him. So we're kind of, we know he was a descendant of Christopher's, and we've kind of traced ourselves up to him, but we have a lot to figure out. So one of the first things that I would do is I want to look at the big record group. Okay. So we want to look at we want to look at vital records. We want to look at probates and wills. We want to look at land records. So those are kind of the big ones. Um, unfortunately, we can't really do census for Mark because when did the census start? They didn't have a census back then. <laughs> exactly because it was still part of the British Empire. Right. There, there might have been other censuses that the British Crown conducted, okay. but it's not what we think of as being the census. Okay. So the, first, the first census was 1790, so we can't really use that. Oh, another thing we could try looking at is newspapers. Oh, yeah, okay. We could also look at military records, um, because even though he died, what was the date again? 1779. So... You know, he might have died during the war, because that's right in the middle of the Revolutionary War. Or right. maybe, maybe he was old enough to serve in the French and Indian War, or one of the other border excursions. We already know when he was born and approximately when he died, but, you know, it's always great to find a cemetery record, because it might give us clues to the rest of his family. We could also find court records. But what if your ancestor was a rule breaker? Um, what if they had boundaries on their land that the, you know, the fence was always breaking and their sheep were getting out and right, right. following their neighbors. But I would definitely start with some of those top things that I've already mentioned, vital records, military, 
lander and probate. Those would be the big four that I would start off with. Oh, that's a great help. Those are some great thoughts. I never would have thought to go into those particular types, the probate and wills. Um, I mean, I would imagine if he had property, it would be listed there and, and whatnot, and relatives would be listed there as well. Deb, thank you so much for all of your help with this. I'm very excited. I can't wait to, um, to go explore the records of Portsmouth, New Hampshire now. We'll have, to, <laughs> we'll have to have another, another chat with some, when I have a little bit more information and we can, we can tackle qu uh, plan number two. Okay. So good luck. I hope you find something. Thank you. Me too. Thanks for all of your help. And thanks for appearing on Discovering Your Past again. Oh, you're welcome. It was a pleasure. I hope that you will continue your journey in discovering your past. For more information on this or any episode, visit us at discoveringyourpast.wordpress.com. Thank you.